Okay, good evening and welcome to the Issaquah Council study session for Tuesday, November 26th. Um, first, I wanna start out by saying that Council Member Goodman is excused for tonight and I want to welcome our newest Council Member, uh, Barb D. Michelle, who has joined and been sworn in today and will immediately sit for her first meeting. Welcome. Yeah, and so um, tonight we have three agenda items, the tree canopy update, uh, ID 0454, the healthy community strategy, and ID 0580, title 18 update. For each, we will have a presentation by staff, council questions, then public comments, and public comments tonight will be up at the lectern of sorts. Um, and then council direction ultimately back to the administration. And so tonight we are gonna start with the tree canopy update presented by Jeff Watling, our Parks and Recreation Director. Thank you so much. Good evening, council. Yeah, so um, tonight uh, uh, the tree canopy assessment uh, was completed and excited to, to provide you uh, this um, update. Uh, as you know, this is one of our 2019 work plan um, items. Uh, tonight is an informational update. In fact, it was originally scheduled for uh, December 2nd, uh, but I think given um, time and opportunity, we, we squeezed it in, into the study session, so thank you very much for that. Um, given our allotted time and, and certainly the, the items on the rest of the agenda, I'm not planning to go into a deep dive um, into um, all of the data, the very rich data that's in this assessment. What I'm hoping to do in, in this allotted time is to provide an overview to help further acquaint you and, and others with the format of the data. Uh, and then spend some time on the recommendations uh, that are in the, uh, in the document and then thus allow ample time for council feedback, uh, public comment, et cetera. So with that, uh, we'll jump into this. So um, the purpose, why, why this was put on our work plan was uh, certainly I, th I think a, a, a shared goal that we wanted to update the uh, prior tree assessment, tree canopy assessment that was done in 2012. You're gonna notice in the document, it's gonna reference 2011 data. That 2011 data is what was in the 2012 report. You'll also notice in the report, this report that we're talking in 2019 uh, references 2017 data because that's the data that was used for uh, the, the assessment we have in, in front of us. Uh, to, to do this work, we partnered with our um, our colleagues and friends at King Conservation District um, and uh, utilized a consultant, uh, Planet Geo. Um, two staff from King Conservation District are here tonight. I want to introduce Bay Covington and uh, Mike uh, Lasecki uh, from KCD. So uh, thanks for, for joining us tonight. Um, so that I don't bury the lead, um, overall in this assessment, um, um, it showed a uh, tree canopy cover, um, our tree canopy cover at 51%. Uh, this does represent a change uh, from the 2012 assessment that had our tree canopy cover at 48%. Um, so uh, certainly represents progress. Um, though this is informational tonight, uh, there is a council question uh, both for tonight and I, and I think really as we move into 2020 and that's um, something we're even asking ourselves obviously as staff, but how can this assessment and how can this data set inform and further support the city's strategic um, and comp plan goals? Um, I would add to that also our operational goals. So the, the, the data itself, the, the document and the analysis itself is really um, broken up. The core of this, the body of this document is broken up into two sections of, of data and evaluation. Uh, the first one um, really has to do with um, our current, what, what's called the, the state of the canopy. So what is our current canopy cover? Um, uh, within our current existing city boundary. Um, I'll point something out a little bit uh, later when I get to the second item uh, that's important to note. Um, so not only looking at this collective citywide um, 51%, uh, the assessment then in this section of 
um, the state of our current canopy, uh, then um, begins to tabulate the information um, in some really helpful ways and some useful ways by running it through a variety of boundary types. Uh, you may have noticed uh, those boundary types um, include ownership, uh, so really trying to help us maybe uh, analyze the data and see, data and see what it says um, between public spaces, what's canopy cover look like in public spaces versus private uh, owned spaces. Um, zoning uh, is a, a, another um, boundary um, type that, that we look at, uh, sort of asking ourselves, what does canopy cover look like and what is it telling us within our various uh, uses, land uses? Uh, and this is zoning, uh, city zoning, so really looking at that from a city scale. The land use lens um, takes a look at that canopy uh, data through King County comprehensive land, uh, comp plan land uses uh, to maybe help us get some perspective on if we're wanting to seek some countywide scale in terms of how we compare what, what canopy cover looks like compared to some of those um, county land uses. Um, a, a really helpful breakdown I think for us um, as we uh, look at um, development planning, um, and other land use planning is the planning sub areas. So the 16 planning sub areas, this tree canopy analysis is, is broken down um, into those uh, sub areas. And then lastly, um, we have 24 census block groups uh, within the city. Uh, that data is filtered through um, that boundary lens um, to see if there's any indicators um, for us with canopy cover in terms of demographic or, uh, and or socioeconomic uh, data or comparisons. So with that section of sort of the, our current state of, of the canopy, uh, the next section of the document then begins to say, all right, now that we have a sense of where our current canopy is, how does it compare? How do we begin to look at that prior assessment and see where, and let's analyze change uh, from that 2011 data to the 2017 data. Um, I wanna point out when you get into this section, the the boundaries are a little bit different in that um, uh, I think the report did a really good job of making sure in this section we're looking at apples to apples. So uh, where is in the first section, the state of our canopy, we're, we were looking at the current city boundary. So there were some boundary changes that occurred between these dates, like Sammamish State Park was annexed. Um, so that land was identified in that first section, the state of the canopy. In this analysis, the change, change analysis, the consultants were really good at making sure we go back and let's do an apples to apples with our current data, but let's compare it to um, that same boundary um, as we had in 2011. So important to, to um, see and understand that, that distinction. What's interesting to note is even with that apples to apples comparison, there was a 3% uh, positive change in, in canopy cover uh, from 11 to, to 17, 2011 to 2017. And then we often like to ask ourselves, how do we compare uh, to our neighbors and our, our other county cities? Um, this is a helpful tool that uh, Planet Geo did uh, a lot of work, um, tree assessment work on all these other cities, so helpful to see this comparison, though ultimately we do certainly measure ourselves to, to our uh, community vision and values and goals. It's, it's, it's always nice to see how we stack up, and I, I think we stack up quite well um, um, in comparison with uh, the other cities. Uh, you see us in the darker green there at 51%. And the last item of, of my staff report before discussion is uh, just looking at the recommendations and, and calling out what the recommendations were on, you'll see this on page 26 of the document. There were five suggested recommendations uh, that came from this um, as I, Go through the recommendations. I'll also highlight some of the operational work uh, that's both underway, but also um, as we're um, heading into 2020, um, areas and ways with which we see us beginning to um, address um, these these recommendations. The first was uh, let's let's find ways uh, to leverage these results to promote the the urban forest, and this promotion can happen both in how we maintain and steward the urban forest and also how uh, we're planning. 
so within the maintenance side of things, um, you're aware uh, that another 2019 goal of ours was launching our Green Issaquah Initiative um, and doing a forest assessment. That's underway. In fact, on December 10th, um, the team from Forterra um, and us in the Parks Department will be providing you a, an update on where we're on in that work. But um, a lot of that work really coincides well with um, looking at best practices, looking at where we're seeing our forest, our publicly owned forest most threatened, um, and beginning to develop some strategies there. Um, other ways we see um, this first recommendation coming into play um, as we've had some meetings and conversations with development services about this assessment. Uh, you'll hear later tonight um, some of the work with updating Title 18 um, and how uh, this data um, and, and this tool can, can help in that, in that work. Uh, the, the second recommendation was um, let's use the results to prioritize future plantings. Um, uh, and yes, absolutely, and, and as I said earlier, as we uh, begin to um, complete that forest assessment with Green Issaquah, we'll be putting together a management plan that you'll be seeing um, in early 2020. Uh, that plan will include priorities, and those priorities um, also include not only restoration, but where can we target um, uh, planting. So uh, this assessment uh, will certainly be a great um, source of information for that work. Uh, maintenance of street trees was seen as a, as a recommendation and um, yes, certainly, absolutely. And as the department that oversees a majority of that street maintenance, um, we really see this not only in ongoing maintenance and stewardship of those trees, but also the systems um, and, and processes that support those street trees. Um, so I, I would, as an example, note irrigation. Um, so street trees often don't survive and thrive on their own. Uh, they, they need support systems. And so we do have some tired irrigation throughout our, our infrastructure. And that's something we're certainly paying attention to, um, not just the, the trees, but those systems. Another example is as we work with development services on that Title 18 work, uh, let's look at planting standards. How are we planting those street trees uh, to um, assure best practices and ensure uh, the survival um, that we want within those street trees. <clears throat> uh, fourth recommendation was education and outreach programs towards private landowners. Uh, I think this is something that we uh, do informally, but um, I do think that there's um, 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 opportunity for us to, to look at maybe more intentionality and how we further explore um, um, uh, informing, educating private um, property owners um, um, of the forest that exists on there. Uh, the, the trees on their property are part of the urban forest and what can they be doing to, to support that? So that's certainly something we can work further on. And the last recommendation was calling out um, uh, this interactive um, canopy planning tool that, that really came with this assessment. And what this is, is Planet Geo, who does this work around the country, uh, they um, support a very robust um, interactive um, software system that this data is now fed into. Um, this would allow us as staff, you as city council, uh, residents, um, other community members to access uh, this interactive tool uh, to not only I think, dig a little deeper into the data, but, but look at um, um, uh, ways, scenarios, um, if we were to plant trees in certain areas, what would that do to, uh, to the data? So a great opportunity there to uh, not only use that as staff, but uh, we'll be working with the communications team um, and administration on how we can further promote that, um, that resource and that tool. Uh, again, not just for us as staff, but for the, the community as well. So with that, that's it's my quick staff report. And, Questions, comments? Councilmember Martz or President Martz. Uh, Director Watling, thank you for that report. Um, I, I wanna first mention it's it's a little bit tough. There's information in this uh, presentation tonight that isn't in the packet. Um, I mean, this presentation itself is not in the packet. There's specific technical data that's in this presentation that's not in the packet um, about comparable cities. And then the recommendations are not in the packet also. So it's a little bit tough for us 
as uh, as um, it'd be nice to be able to preview this this information. Yeah, and I, I apologize for that. And I know with the schedule change, we we worked really really fast to to get this uh, in the Got agenda. It. But that's a great a great point. Thank you. Uh, two specific questions. How did we go up? I, I don't recall transferring a bunch of. Uh, on, I don't r recall large, large new swaths of, of uh, canopied land. How, how did how did we get from 48 to 51? Yeah, I, I, the assessment I think asked that question, and I think on page 20, um, it I think identifies I think a number of reasons. I think there has been growth in uh, growth in the trees. Um, I'll read from the assessment itself. Um, I think there's also a, a, an increased accuracy, uh, quite frankly, in, in some of the, the base information. Uh, though en evidence of canopy losses due to urban development were observed, there were also evidence of expansion of forest resources through tree plantings and natural growth. There were many instances where the 2011 data appeared underestimated. However, the use of LIDAR data from 2017 assessment combined with the natural growth allowed for easier capture of some of the smaller trees resulting in a citywide gain. So um, I, I say that quote because I, I, the report itself is, is I, I think saying yes, there's probably some gain, but some of that 3% is probably just a, a sharper um, assessment and evaluation of the, of the data. Got it, and I note that the plus or minus on this is uh, the, the gain is within the plus or minus, right. so as, yep. as it points out, it yep. could be statistically uh, not significant. The second question that I have is, could you bring up the comparable cities yep. uh, again? So part of me is a little concerned that I don't see uh, what I think of as comparable cities here. I don't see Sammamish, I don't see Redmond, uh, I don't see Kirkland, I don't see uh, Snoqualmie, I don't see North Bend. I see cities that are all substantially more urban than our city. So part of me is just a little skeptical that this is an actual comparables list. So um, I won't, I don't know if I'll feel warm and fuzzy about being number two on this list until I see some cities that I feel look more like us. Yep, great point. We weren't going for warm and fuzzy, we were going for information that Planet Geo had on hand, but yeah. it's a great point. Deputy Council President Batiste. Uh, just to follow up on that question, um, it, I'm not positive if every city has, has every city done um, a tree canopy assessment. I seem to have some, a recollection that um, some, some have, some have, have it's not a requirement, cities, so I, I don't know. Some cities haven't, so we may, we may not have that data. Um, and then uh, with, the, um, with the urban forest, I know we talked a lot about that and we, we um, to think back on our initial conversations about this, and the tree canopy was something that really came forward um, as work that we would do uh, in uh, the, the upcoming year. Are there other elements of just the urban forest um, work plan in general that will be coming up or is this sort of our top? I'm trying to think back on the conversation. Yeah, it was, it's really, it's two, two key items in 2019. So this canopy assessment update and then the work we're doing with Forterra that you'll hear on December 10th in terms of launching green, the Green Issaquah the initiative. Green Issaquah. Okay, yep. okay, thank you. You bet. Council Member Ray. Thanks. So I think this is great. I think we're headed in the right direction on tree canopy. We all wanna be greener. Um, but I, I can't help but think about urban wildfires and what are we doing and how can we use this data to help us better prepare in the uh, unfortunate event that something like that should occur. Great question. I, I think both in this, I think that question has come up as we've been talking with Forterra. I know as we've been um, in conversations with Eastside Fire and Rescue and some of the, the preparedness work that they're doing. Um, uh, it's certainly something that you'll see in the, um, uh, the management plan um, coming forward before you in the first quarter of next year. Um, Council Member Winterstein. Thank you. Jeff, thanks for the report. 
you know, as I've talked to people over the years, that a lot of times people are aware of what happens across the street or down the road from them or something that they pass all the time. And if there's been some change in their neighborhood, they're, wow, a couple big trees are gone. And I think that message that, that you know, for sometimes that happens, but look, let's, let's look at what's happening at the neighborhood overall and what type of policies and what we're trying to do to encourage this. And um, so I, I tell you that story because my number one, or a top priority I would ask is, is that communication? Are those campaigns? Is that ability to get that, to communicate these facts? I know they're just numbers, but there's some really good stories in all of these as well, I think that are very important to what uh, a lot of people hold dear about Issaquah. But when they see something in their proximity, they might, I know for a fact many people, know some, it's going in the wrong direction. But when indeed, when you look at it at this level, at the city level, uh, it's, it's a different story and so, However, through communications or whatever programs that you do, I think this is one that um, is, well, I hope we can communicate effectively. Communicating that bigger picture and realizing that the, the, the urban forest is a dynamic, changing, evolving thing that. And I'll add one more thing to that. Uh, when we don't have the flag up here anymore, but in Arbor City, USA, and, I, and when uh, a couple years ago when we were receiving that award, a day afterwards, I spoke to uh, the representative from that organization, and we had an interesting conversation. When they when they talk, when they assess cities of being you know uh, tree cities, um, they allow for policies. The fact that it, if you take some trees down, but there's for a public good, there's there's it, it could be um, it could be somebody's house, or it could be some other uh, it could be roadway related. Right, but there's some public amenity that's being built or improved that they don't hold that against you. They, at least you have a plan. You're wearing that. There, if there's a if there's a public benefit for what was done, that assessment you know didn't hold that against you. The fact that you had a plan and we were looking at that and trying to measure and manage it, the tree canopy was a big part of their scoring as well. And I I, I just think and that is counterintuitive to what a lot of people I think. Uh, Imagine that when they see this going, how can you be a tree city when you're taking trees out the middle of a planting on a, on a street? Well, we're doing this to improve the roadway. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's kind of the education, that this, not everybody has the same kind of understanding of, of how these measurements are done. Mm -hmm. But again, if you just look at one project, you might, you might uh, draw the wrong conclusion. Uh, and whereas that's always unfortunate, but when there's a public benefit, that's something good, I guess. But the, co the comprehensive story is important. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Council Member DeMichel. Hi, thank you. So I learned a lot from this, Jeff. It was a, a really thorough report. Uh, and I think I'm following along with Council Member Winterstein. Um, it seems to me that a number of years ago, we had a, uh, we had a code that said if you took down a tree in your yard, you had to figure out a way to replace it. And um, that apparently is not the case anymore. Is, is there anything like that in policy? I would phone a friend, I'd phone <laughs> development services to confirm that, but I believe there's still code that. That, that is a active code then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mr. I, Niven is uh, making his way. Oh. <laughs> oh the chief seats. No. <laughs> Good evening, Keith Niven, Development Services. Um, so the code right now talks about trees in terms of number of trees you can remove per year um, with or without a permit, and then when properties are redeveloped, how much of the tree canopy needs to be preserved as part of that activity. So the code the, where, where the council has landed on this previously is not to expect that everybody has to keep every tree in the city um, for the rest of time. It's recognizing there's hazard trees, um, there's all sorts of reasons why trees periodically need to be removed. Um, you know, the hope is when we redevelop and when things come back in that there are always new opportunities to re plant and to densify the canopy, and I think that's part of what this study showed. So Jeff, from my perspective, and this 
edges quite nicely out of this. Um, on page 20 of the report, there are some pictures of the urban tree canopy loss and the urban tree canopy gain. So what I would hope the city would take as an action item from this is to take a look at particularly the loss, because it's, it's one thing to compare ourselves to other cities. It's another thing to compare ourselves to previous um, versions of ourselves and to take a look at that and say, okay, for example, in the law scenario, um, was that because of redevelopment? And did the what actually happened meet our expectation of what our code said would happen? Um, so were more trees removed? Were they replanted? You know, something like that that gives us a sense of are we getting what we expect mm -hmm. from code to help our tree canopy, or is there an adjustment that we need to make maybe to Title 18 right. or our education to landowners or something like that that helps us get the result that we're looking for? Good point. Okay, so do we have any other questions or comments before I go to public comment? Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna ask for public comment. We've got an area up there. If anybody has a public comment, you can stand and go over there. Um, I will go right ahead, yep. Yeah, and go ahead and state your name and any relationship and. Okay, uh, yep, good evening. My name's Mike Lasecki, I'm the Forest Stewardship Programs Manager at King Conservation District. Um, so yeah, I guess for my public comment, I just wanted to say that you know we we really are excited about the work that the City of Issaquah has been doing, not only with the you know this urban tree canopy assessment, but also the Green Issaquah Partnership, which uh, we also helped fund through an MJ grant, and then also uh, just this past week we um, executed a cost share agreement with the Talis Community Association to. Uh, implement a forest stewardship project on some of their community open spaces that will restore about four acres of forest land. Um, the other things I wanted to talk about uh, were that we are gonna be doing a free forest health and wildfire uh, seminar at the Issaquah Library. This is gonna be a free um, two hour sort of community presentation and it's open to anyone. Um, WSU Extension uh, staff, Kevin Zobers, will be talking about forest health issues, really helping people understand why we're seeing tree deaths in our region. And then uh, one of our staff members, Matthew Axe, who is our wildfire services program coordinator, he'll be talking about wildfire on the west side, um, the Issaquah I-90 corridor area specifically, and sort of the unique um, challenges and opportunities it presents, and then also be talking about what landowners and communities can do to sort of help prepare um, for wildfire. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say and appreciate it. So that's gonna be um, December 17th and it will be from six to 8 p.m. Uh, no registration required. Um, and if you go to the WCU Extension website, they'll have details, our website, and I think it's already up on the library website as well. All right. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And do we have anybody else who would like to make a public comment? Fantastic. And my name is Mary Lynch and I reside at 2690 Northwest Oak Crest Drive, Issaquah, Washington. And I wanna thank the city for funding this. Um, it's something that I've personally been asking for for a number of years. Um, Cause to be very honest, I've asked for the copy of the 2012 document and have never received it. The only thing I have available is a 2006 study. So it's really interesting to see that we had to 2012. Um, that being said, I haven't really had a chance to dig into it and um, read through it. Still have a little bit of concern is, um, and kind of to back up 
uh, some of the comments from the council is this was done in 2017. We've had quite a little bit of development and trees canopy loss since then with some developments along Newport Way, those up around the Providence Point along 43rd, Kilcarry and other areas where we've had old established um, big leaf maples that have gone down. Uh, just recently along Newport Way uh, with an expansion of um, Reva, we also had some canopy trees come down and basically we're told by the city that street trees are not protected. Because when those come, came down, we tried to say what's gonna be replanted there. And we're told that there is no code, there is no protection for street trees. So something going forward, especially since it's been noted in here how important our street trees are to our canopy, is I really think we should have some assessment. And I know that it can be public benefit to remove them, but if we remove trees, just and what I just died this week when I drove down and saw them looking at the sycamores along Newport Way, and luckily they just trimmed them up, but I know there is some, has been some talk with the skate park that all those have to come down if we widen Newport Way there. And those trees ought to be replaced, and if at all possible, saved, um, but replaced someplace else. The other thing that happens, that I notice that happens with code is yes, we replace a certain number in a, in a um, complex, but what like happened with ours many years ago is they required them to plant cedar trees. Well, those cedar trees now have become hazardous trees. And there's no real code now. Our, our tree code uh, that I worked on and tried to get so it really meant something is really weak and watered down. There is really no, um, homeowners don't have to replace the major trees that they cut down. So most of those trees that were planted 30 years ago as part of the code, are coming down because they're hazardous trees because they're too big and close to the house and don't have to be replaced. We also had a citizen about three weeks ago cut down two beautiful oak trees because he said they were hazardous trees. They weren't, they weren't close to his house that they caused anything except leaves, but he didn't have to replace. And these are again, 25 year old beautiful oak trees that were removed and didn't have to be replaced. So I think we need to really stre strengthen our codes for tree removal and make sure that we're replacing and replacing wherever. When we have mitigation, I've seen no documents of when somebody doesn't have to plant trees because of mitigation, i.e. Uh, Evergreen Ford, where is that tree fund being monitored and where are those number of trees that are being allowed to be cut? Where are those being replaced and what are they being placed with? And although I like street trees, I don't think street trees do the amount of stormwater management that a big leaf maple or a tall evergreen does. And I really appreciate working with King County and I think going forward because of climate change, we do need to look at the different types of trees that we use. So we need to improve the code for existing residential, for new development, and for city parks, schools, which we don't really maintain and require them, as well as our public um, operations and our public right away. Thank you. Thank you. Connie? So, Connie Marsh, and um, I agree with Mary. I've had many a conversation about all of those things and made little forward progress. It just seems like uh, if, when you're looking at this, the city and all those functions, there should be a, a standardized way to go through and ascertain what your tree impacts are going to be and what all departments, right of way or not, are required to do for replacement. And right now, they're, uh, because it's right of way, they don't have to go through our regular land use code. They have their own standards. And uh, the parks, parks is fascinating because parks is madly planting trees in some places and we don't really know where or how or whether they're growing or whether all those Boy Scout projects do what they hope. Um, and then they also take down trees and try to maintain st street trees, very complex. So my overarching 
thing that I didn't see in the report is there's trees, then there's reasons for trees, and then there's the right trees in the right places to do the right things. And it, it's, it's, you don't just plant a tree because you're planting a tree and that's automatically a good thing. When we have parking lots, we have security, we have concrete shading, we have all, all types of reasons for those trees and heights. In the central Issaquah plan, uh, we don't even have to plant trees in parking lots. We can use man-made decorative screening instead of any green, pretty much at all. And I totally disagree with that because that is just asking for a heat sink because one of the reasons that we have trees in parking lot is to offset this heat that you get in, in parking lots and provide shade and respite for people. So you, uh, So when we plan, where we should have our trees, we also have to figure out why we should have them there. And then we have to figure out how we are going to maintain them and how on private development, we are actually going to make sure that they maintain them because you know if we aren't looking and they cut down the trees, then they can do more bad things to their property in the future because it's not in as good a condition. And if your property is in bad condition, then you don't have to improve it because it's in bad condition. Sounds crazy, but it's true. You only have to offset or, or mitigate your impacts often. So if it's bad, it can stay bad. You just don't have, you can't make it worse. So we don't have really any review of private plantings that are required. After our five year mo maintenance and monitoring period, unless a public person complains about it, eh, it's, it could be gone. We don't even know. So, unless they want something, if they want to put in a new irrigation, then we can bap them. I, and yes, it's about tree canopy. But when you're thinking about what to do with tree canopy information, I think you have to look at it in a more complex way. Thanks. Thank you, Connie. And yeah, go ahead, Steve. Hi, Steve Pereira, I live in Old Town for about 12 years now. Uh, so I don't want to repeat the comments I've already sent in, uh, just kind of highlighted a couple things. One was, uh, it talks about street trees and other trees. Often the trees that are replaced are replaced with little scrawny trees that don't seem to meet the same definition of type of tree or provide the same benefit of tree. So I'd like to see some standardization as far as language, as far as what's required for tree replacement. I'd like to see some and looked at of what Issaquah standards are for what percentage of tree canopy we're seeking to maintain in Issaquah. If it went from 48 to 51%, I've heard of 50% is what we wanted to keep it at. What are we willing to do to make that happen? I'd like to see some goal statements in there that aren't in place today. Uh, I'd like to see the, and it sounds like there's some, I'd like to see the city parks department have more of a standardized role in implement, implementing and managing both the city-owned properties and maybe enforcement or mechanisms for non-city-owned properties, not just partnering, but what does that partnering look like? Is there some ways that we can maintain or enhance that environment? Um, I'd like to see some standard that says, when we talk about tree canopy, we're not just saying, ooh, that looks pretty, but we're looking at what the benefits are of having a tree canopy. Is there uh, water filtration that happens that we lose when we lose a tree canopy. I don't think that's been talked about at all. All we see is that looks pretty and what that benefit is from that isn't measured or seeming to be valued. At. We're just looking at having runoff from uh, less tree canopy, more impervious surfaces uh, going near our waterways. That, what's that do to the salmon? What's that do to the long-term environment? Um, it seems like as we continue to grow, we're gonna have this uh, ever incre decreasing amount of tree canopies unless we're actively managing that. I talked about the city right away property where I think the study showed that 15% of the tree canopy exists with planned infrastructure growth. What does that tree canopy loss look like for those areas? I didn't see numbers. I didn't see that reflected in the report. It seems that we're destined to, to shrink over time, maybe some quicker than others. 
And I guess the last point, as we look at the zoning and coding that's gone into place, uh, do we wanna look at maybe, as we've opened up the valley floor, do we wanna look at some spots that have tree canopy remaining, have them down zoned so we lose less of that tree canopy? I don't know that I have the answer. I know it's a controversial thing, but I think that needs to be part of the discussion going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And do we have anybody else who'd like to make comment on this? Asking for a second time, any comments? And a third time, okay. And I would just like to take the moment, say for anybody who's watching at home, we know you have opinions. We know you might not be able to come down here. I'd like to encourage everybody, you have questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, email citycouncil at issaquawa.gov. We'd love to hear from you, so thank you on that. Um, the next item on our agenda is ID 0454, the Healthy Community Strategy, and this is going to be presented by Director Fujimoto, our Sustainability Director. David. Good evening, council members. Again, David Fujimoto, Sustainability Director. Uh, thank you for uh, having us here tonight. Um, I'm also joined here by a couple of folks, Monica Negrila, who's relatively, well, sort of new to the city, I should say. She's almost just about a year here. Uh, she's our Human Services and, and um, Social Sustainability Coordinator. Uh, she comes to us from a regional nonprofit. She was previously the Executive Director of a behavioral health organization, so we're really glad to have her join us here. And then I'm all, we're also joined by Erica Rett, who's uh, been work, who works with uh, Burke Consulting, has been working with us on this project on some of the technical aspects as well. <clears throat> there are a couple of additional team members who are not here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we've integrated some of this work. Uh, it relates to um, some housing strategy work on strategy nine specifically. Uh, Trish Heinonen and our long range planning group has been part of that, as well as Courtney Garcia with the Senior Center in looking at some of the senior needs. Uh, so there's some additional team members. <clears throat> As a little bit of background or overview for what we'll be covering this evening uh, to talk about the healthy community strategy, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the history and some of the origins of the work, uh, the overall approach to the strategy development, some of the initial findings from uh, kind of our deeper dive into some of the data and some conversations with the community and the associated uh, focus areas that we've identified. And then we'll talk some more about the next steps. <coughs> Uh, first off, I also want to note as uh, as we're kind of starting this consideration of the healthy community strategy, we've identified a number of policy considerations moving forward. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight those uh, right off the bat. Um, we're gonna be talking specifically about this first bullet um, because there's a large quantity of information where we really wanna kind of focus in on that area. We're kind of at a juncture in this project where uh, we're identifying some of those key focus areas and then the next step going forward will be to uh, start to work more actively with some of our community stakeholders to look at strategies designed around those focus areas. So this is a good juncture to kind of get you up to speed on where we're at with the project, talk about some of the details and some of the findings and get some feedback on those areas. <clears throat> As we go forward, uh, we'll have more opportunities to talk more about the resources that uh, should be applied to those, uh, ways in which we could leverage partnerships, um, ways that the city can have a, a role either in supporting um, some of those services or finding other opportunities uh, to deliver those. Um, and then uh, because we know that there's a, a very large uh, number of needs that we also know that prioritization is gonna be important. We're looking at developing a five-year strategy and so um, that kind of feedback about what the criteria should be that we apply to the strategies is really important. Um, and then also because we want to um, follow a continuous improvement path, those performance measures that will help to guide us in terms of feedback about how we're doing, as well as kind of some larger or some broader population level indicators to inform our progress uh, will be some pieces. Um, <clears throat> but as I mentioned tonight, we're gonna be focusing mostly on that first bullet, the uh, review and discussion of key focus areas. <clears throat> 
And to provide some background and context for the healthy community strategy, um, the strategy actually has some history with a council goal um, that uh, dates uh, several years back. Um, th that was a process that pre-existed uh, or existed prior to the, the strategic planning process, um, which has largely been re replaced by that approach. Um, the, the council goal actually led to a, a kind of a multi-step process beginning with the development of a, a white paper to help put some shape and form around healthy communities and uh, provide the area of focus for that. Um, so that was the building a healthy community white paper which was completed. The next step in the process was development of a community needs assessment, and that was an opportunity to take a closer look at secondary data, uh, some qualitative and quantitative data to help get us a little bit more information and grounded in terms of uh, what we're seeing in the community. It also had the benefit of providing some foundations for our work with the Human Services Commission and our granting process that came forward. So that gave uh, some more foundation to that commission's work and how they viewed the, the grants and made the selection process. And so that's informed our latest grant cycle, uh, which continues, which was for 2019 and 2020. Um, and then most recently, the healthy community strategy uh, uh, was incorporated into the strategic, act, strategic plan under the uh, social and economic vitality section. Uh, it's listed as an action under uh, one strategic plan objective, um, which uh, was that services and resources reduce inequities in health and well-being in the community. And it spoke about adoption and implementation of a healthy community strategy, knowing that this work was underway, but we hadn't fully finalized what those actions were. So we're in that process of outlining those actions uh, that will give you some further consideration of how those will play out in the future. <clears throat> a couple of pieces in, important for background. Um, the uh, white paper and the community needs assessment spoke about this approach of using a social determinants of health uh, a framework for thinking about healthy communities. And really the idea here is that there are a large number of factors which extend beyond uh, medical health and personal choices that really affect the health of a community. Uh, a lot of these are upstream, a lot of them are uh, co-related, um, but there are a variety of things that are, are really important to the health of the community. And so this is a, a broader view of health um, it, it takes into consideration um, uh, a variety of factors such that are social and physical in nature, such as income and employment, education, the built and natural environments, and the social relationships in the community. And then the other framework that we're also looking at with this project is because we're looking at strategies, is looking at an outcome-based approach. Uh, one of these is a results-based accountability approach. There are several others. We're kind of using that as a guiding tool for us. We're not following it to the strictest sense of the manner. But the idea is really that the focus is on out outcomes and results that we're desiring to see in the community. So as we think about these focus areas and these populations, we'll be working to further outline you know, what are the results that we're hoping to achieve or work, what are the changes that we're hoping to see in the community. And then we work backwards from those, those desired outcomes to develop strategies that will help to move the needle, if you will, on those different um, strategies. Um, and then we also know that because these strategies uh, will take multiple actors in the community, it's not just a, a city um, effort on its own. Uh, we do have a robust community of nonprofit organizations in town. Uh, a large part of this is um, working collaborative, collaboratively with those organizations uh, because we know that each of our uh, individual contributions will help to make the change over time. Uh, so that's a big part of it. And then the other part is that uh, it really uses data to inform progress. Uh, provides for accountability. Um, it's a way for um, multiple organizations which have common goals to align um, and to take a look at the data and to use that um, to inform how we shape the work, how we make changes, and how we proceed forward. Uh, so in that way, it also helps to foster collaboration. Uh, and you'll see that kind of that box on the lower right talks about, um, th that's actually related to some to an approach on data. It talks about both quantity and quality of da data and outcomes and results, and both the effort and the effect. And so we can talk about how much of a thing we deliver, how well we did it, but ultimately what matters is, uh, is anybody ever actually better off? And so that's really thinking about the effect of the work that's being done. 
And then as I mentioned before, we had a, um, a couple of other staff who've been working on this project with us. Um, as we started to scope the work that we, we identified that there was some related work that was planned or underway in the city. Um, that was related to the housing strategy nine, as I mentioned. That was kind of the strategy that was focused in on the services related to housing. So it was a little bit more about thinking about kind of how, what are the supportive things that actually help uh, affordable housing or vulnerable populations be successful because we know that just ha having the housing by itself uh, won't lead to success. Uh, so it talks about uh, seniors, individuals who are experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity, uh, individuals with disabilities, kind of those special populations. And so we took a look at that, knew that that work was happening, uh, had some conversations with our development services department and incorporated that work. Um, at the same time, the senior uh, city was starting to take over services for the senior center um, and starting to look at how do, uh, do we best serve our senior population. And so uh, there is a grant that um, the uh, senior center was able to secure, I think it's actually coming to council in the next month. Uh, but as a part of that, there was a senior needs assessment that was being looked at and that per will help to provide a nice uh, supplement to the community needs assessment. Um, and I'll also think about kind of senior services beyond the doors of just the senior center, but services to seniors overall in the community. So um, this is a better way or a way to provide for a more holistic look at those, uh, those populations in the community and kind of bring them all together under one overall strategy. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Monica uh, next to talk a little bit more about kind of the specifics of the approach um, and how we kind of dove into the details. And then also uh, Erica will be going into some of the findings as well. And then we'll, um, uh, we're happy to take uh, questions along the way. Thank you, David. I can scroll oh. for you if you like, or. Okay, we'll leave So as David mentioned, I will provide some additional information regarding the approach and methodology we used for the Healthy Community Strategy. Uh, we started by building upon the work um, uh, provided and conducted in the community needs assessment. Our intent was not to redo the needs assessment, but rather to further uh, analyze and provide for a deeper understanding of the gaps identified in the community. Um, our work centered around the experiences reported by the community members, and in the next few minutes, I will also uh, talk a little bit more about our engagement and outreach process. Um, so for the community needs assessment, based on both the quantitative and qualitative data done uh, during that work, um, the community needs assessment identified four major themes. Um, also referred as to needs or gaps in our presentation. Um, the first one was disparities by race and ethnicity, sex and income. Um, next was lack of stable housing, uh, barriers to accessing services and resources, and behavioral health norms and resources. Um, during the next phase of work, uh, the themes identified in the community needs assessment were confirmed and then further explored to provide for an in-depth understanding of the gaps. Uh, we accomplished this by conducting stakeholder interviews, uh, community engagement such as focus groups and informational interviews, outreach uh, to the community, um, and um, attending uh, events in the community where we could meet with um, residents. Uh, we also uh, gathered um, demographic, demographic and statistical information, uh, the quantitative data, and then we conducted an inventory of housing and supportive services. For the stakeholder interviews uh, for this project, we conducted um, interviews with 18 uh, organizations that provide support and services to Issaquah residents. Uh, we selected the organizations based on the work they do in the Issa Issaquah community and based on the variety of services and supports they provide. Um, we also uh, considered the development of new programs and services um, since the last round of interviews. And uh, we also considered the variety of sectors that uh, would be represented, uh, such as the educational system, health, uh, fire, um, first responders, faith communities, or nonprofits. 
Um, in addition to the list of organizations uh, that you see on the screen, um, there are also a few other organizations that were not um, um, able to participate in the, inter in the interview, so it's not a full comprehensive list. For the engagement part, um, we um, participated in a um, series of um, community engagements. Specifically, we uh, conducted three focus groups uh, with youth in the community, including cultural groups. Um, three other focus groups um, with adults, um, and this one also included a focus group uh, with cultural groups. Uh, we also engaged with individuals who are homeless. Uh, we held a focus group at the senior center with seniors, um, and we participated and engaged with residents at a health fair um, that was held at the um, um, Swedish hospital. And in addition, we conducted interviews with city staff who, um, uh, from multiple departments at the city who serve the community. Um, we engaged with uh, over 120 um, residents in this process. Um, and then next, <clears throat> as a result of the interviews and the engagement efforts, um, the areas of focus were identified and grouped by populations to help distinguish between the specific challenges that each population group is facing in Issaquah. Uh, for example, behavioral health norms um, are reflected differently for the different age groups. Um, what um, a youth may be facing um, um, may be different than what an, an older adult or aging adult may be facing. Uh, for example, a youth may be dealing with um, anxiety and um, peer pressure or um, educational pressures, whereas an aging adult might um, face isolation. Um, so for that reason, we decided to um, group the um, um, data that we gathered by the different populations, by the different, um, my apologize, by the different age groups. Uh, in addition, we also realized that people have multiple needs that are interconnected, and therefore taking a more holistic and person-centered approach makes more sense. Um, and so that was the other reason why we decided to um, group the data uh, by the different um, uh, age groups. Um, so um, now I'm gonna let um, Erica take it from here and provide us with the uh, um, technical data for children and youth, adults, aging adults, and individuals experiencing homelessness. Thank you. So when we, when we start to look at- Can you okay. turn on your mic? Thanks. Sorry. Better now. When we start to look at the focus areas um, by population group, uh, we really, the information that I'm about to present on pulls, pulls data from both the quantitative results that were um, presented as part of the community needs assessment in 2017 updated quantitative information that we pulled together um, related to some of the special housing populations and um, older adults to supplement that, as well as this ri these rich sources of qualitative information that came through the engagements and the interviews that Monica spoke about. And so um, by combining both those quantitative and qualitative sources, I think it gives a really rich picture of the types of needs that residents in Issaquah have. So when we start to think about children and youth, um, we know that youth in the community are challenging a whole, or um, are facing a whole host of challenges. Um, one of the things that was reported to us has to do with bullying. Um, bullying uh, generally occurs, we don't have a specific statistic to Issaquah, but um, state rates of bullying and national rates of bullying tend to hover around 20%. In interviews and discussions with youth, um, that number wasn't specifically confirmed, but the extent of the bullying that youth face was was confirmed, um, particularly um, issues, bullying occurs due to appearance, 
um, issues of culture, race, and ethnicity, um, gender and gender identity, um, sexual identity, disability, and religion. Uh, um, another another um, challenge that youth face is really has to do with the amount of pressure that they feel. Um, they feel pressure to keep up academically. They tend to feel pressure to please their parents and families, um, and also pressures to keep up with other youth or their perception of, of how well other youth are doing. Um, and so what we see is um, some, some issues with anxiety, depression. Uh, we know that according to the Healthy Youth Survey, which is done every two years by the state of Washington, that 17% um, of Issaquah 12th graders have considered suicide at some point, which is um, a, a fairly alarming statistic, I think. Um, we also know that um, drug and alcohol use and, um, and the use of um, e-cigarettes is also um, an important challenge for youth. Um, in the statistics from the Healthy Youth Survey, 37% of um, 12th graders have used alcohol in the last 30 days, which is considered to be current or active use of alcohol. Um, there's also a fairly high number of um, 12th graders who've engaged in binge drinking. Um, drug use was about, the, the percentage of drug use was about average with um, numbers around the state or slightly lower, but um, there's, uh, in, when we talked with youth, they acknowledged that drug use is prevalent in the community, um, and there were some indications that it is likely to be underreported. Um, the use of vape pens is increasing by youth all across <laughs> the country. About 22% of um, 12th graders are current users of vape pens, which means they, according to the Healthy Youth Survey, they've used a vape pen in the last 30 days. When we take the number of challenges that youth face and we talked with people in the community about the types of resources that are available, um, what we ran up against in almost every case is that the demand for um, assistance almost always exceeds the resources that are available in the community. Adults have a variety of needs, um, and it's really interesting in um, the, the needs that we're gonna talk about for adults, um, including housing insecurity um, and housing affordability. Um, many of these needs affect all people in Issaquah. So when we start thinking about um, children and youth, what we know is that um, uh, youth tend to have um, higher rates of um, mental health challenges in areas where housing is not as affordable, for example. Um, and so a lot of the needs and gaps that we talk about for adults have very specific consequences for people of all age groups. Um, but in the context of talking about housing insecurity for adults, we know that um, adults are cost burdened by, um, households are cost burdened um, across incomes. The average, um, the median income needed to buy a, um, a median priced home is $197,000 in Issaquah, but the median household income is about $100,000. So even for um, middle of the road, median income families, the challenge of, of being able to find housing that they can afford um, is is extremely difficult. Um, when we look at um, all households, about a third of all households in Issaquah um, have cost burden. Cost burden is defined by HUD as households that spend 30% of their income or more on housing expenses. It's considered extremely cost burden for households that spend 50%. Um, and so, 
when we take a look at the variety of income levels, clearly for the, the lower the income, um, the more likely a household is to be cost burdened, which is shown on the bar graphs as the, the light blue is the regular cost burden and the dark blue is the extremely cost burdened. Um, so you would expect that the lower the income, it's more likely to be cost burden, but it is important to see even for moderate income, we have more than, uh, we have 38% cost burdened at those median income. What happens when um, households are cost burdened? Um, they tend to make trade-offs. Um, they spend, they don't have money to spend for childcare or which means that children are more likely to be taking care of other children or adults have to make trade-offs to make the childcare work. They're less likely to spend money on medical care or to get needed medical treatments. There may be less money for healthy food or investments in transportation or to be able to pay for you transportation or utilities. So households are um, at, at all levels are making these, these trade-offs. When we look at the housing options that are available for adults in Issaquah or for families in Issaquah, um, a couple of interesting points of information. First of all, Issaquah has a match, mismatch between housing stock and household size. If you take a look at the number of one person households in Issaquah, it's 30% but they're only 13% of the housing stock is available in studio and one bedroom units. Now we know that not everybody who has a one, one person household wants to live in a one bedroom unit, but what happens when the, when the unit sizes and the households don't have a closer match is that there's a lot of pressure on those few units that are one bedroom. For maybe older people who are looking to downsize, that there aren't smaller units available and that increases the pressure and, the, and creates affordable, affordability issues for um, larger size units as well. And so the, there's this, having a mismatch between the housing stock and the housing size does freeze a fair amount of housing from being able to go through a cycle of exchange. The other thing that we know about housing options is that there's very few rentals available that accommodate people in wheelchairs. Um, one, one thing that I forgot to mention in housing, um, housing security and insecurity is that um, according to rental statistics, um, someone making 80% um, of the median income in Issaquah is not able to afford um, a two bedroom apartment here. And so um, when we talk about um, housing affordability, there's both a gap in, in the ability to rent appropriate units, um, affordable units, as well as um, buying them. Child care came up repeatedly um, in our discussions with people about a need in the community. <coughs> the interesting thing is that um, uh, survey statistics, American Community Survey statistics find that households, um, that, uh, that a fair majority of households with children need child care in Issaquah. For households that have children um, uh, under the ages six and under, 50% of those households have all of the um, adults in the household working, which means that they need childcare, um, full day childcare in order to support, um, they're very likely to need full day childcare. For households in which children are um, ages seven or older, two, in two thirds of the households, all of the adults in the household work. So that speaks to the need for uh, the availability of programs that have care around school hours. Um, but a vast majority of households, uh, family households in Issaquah do need childcare of some sort. Um, income expenditures on, on child care are pretty interesting for infant care, which is that six and under care. Um, it's about, it, it varies because um, 
it varies because the, the range of infant care is, I believe, about thirteen to seventeen thousand dollars. Thirteen to sixteen thousand dollars per year is the average cost of infant care in this region outside of the city of Seattle. Um, and when we look at income expenditures on infant care for um, a family that has two a two-parent household um, with one infant, the income expenditure tends to be about 15% of their household um, income on childcare. For a single parent with an infant, um, that tends to be about 40% of their household income in order um, to have childcare. We also know that with childcare, um, there's a great need there's, there's a lot of options for childcare in Issaquah, but those options tend not to have, um, there's not a lot of affordable options. For example, for someone who receives a childcare subsidy from the state, there's only one place in Issaquah that accepts that subsidy, which is the Bright Horizons at the YWCA Family Village, and they only accept the subsidy for residents of the YWCA Family Village. So if you, um, receive a subsidy and you don't live in the YWCA family village, the closest place you can use your subsidy is Redmond. Um, we also know that for the, the child care program that's run um, before and after school care with the Issaquah School District, the elementary school program is completely full and runs quite an extensive um, waiting list at every school. So. Uh, it's very difficult to find childcare that's affordable in Issaquah for, um, and when you compare that with the number of families who may be struggling to afford the cost of housing, they have less money to spend on childcare and there's not that available in the community. We also heard from immigrant communities that um, childcare is really important um, to them establishing in the community. Um, oftentimes when immigrant women will come with a husband who may be employed in the workforce, their ability to have childcare um, on an as needed or a drop-in basis or even a semi-regular basis, um, without that so childcare support in the community, it affects their ability to learn English, to navigate the variety of systems that they need to navigate to keep their families healthy and to integrate into um, life in the US. So speaking of welcoming and culturally supportive services, um, about one in four people in Issaquah are foreign born and about a fifth of the Households in, in, in Issaquah speak a language other than English. Um, what we found is that in terms of welcoming culturally supportive services, um, that um, there's a number of concerns that people have um, that, that tend to be of different cultural backgrounds. Now, it's very interesting because in some of the engagement that we did, people, both adults and youth, felt that Issaquah was an extremely welcoming community and valued the growing diversity of the community. Um, and I think that for, um, I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of truth and there's some, there's some basis for that, but for people who are um, from different cultures who are trying to live their day-to-day -day life, they may have experiences different from that that other people don't see because they don't walk in their shoes every day. Um, there was a lot of concern from parents and adults about racial and ethnic bullying of their children uh, in schools that, as I mentioned in youth, uh, the youth, that was also mentioned by youth themselves. Um, we also know that from a uh, city survey that people of color tend to feel less comfortable and safe in their community um, and in their neighborhoods. Also, when we talked with people, these types of language and cultural barriers that they experience are very, very isolating. So um, whether it's the, it's the mom who's 
um, home taking care of children and can't get to the, the, the ESL class, um, or sometimes it's, um, it's the older adult who doesn't, who doesn't feel comfortable um, joining in programs that are, um, that are in English because they don't feel their English is very strong. There's a variety of language and cultural barriers. Also, um, sometimes some of those cultural barriers aren't limited just to people who are amongst the foreign-born population. Um, uh, people of uh, people who aren't from other countries but still ethnically um, ethnically diverse in the community um, have reported that they have a really difficult time finding ethnically and culturally appropriate providers. And the way that that was explained to me is that if um, if you go in and you have a, a, a serious medical con concern or a mental health issue, um, it's really, really important to know that the person who's providing service can understand where you're coming from. And for um, some people of color, that means having another person of color available um, that they feel like they can relate to. So. Um, these are some of the issues that, in terms of welcoming culturally supportive services. Mental wellness um, is a category, when we take a look at some of the statistical information, Issaquah is not, um, Issaquah is doing about average in terms of mental wellness. Um, if we're just looking at statistics, mental wellness for adults. But what we see is reports that this is a pretty stressed out community. Um, when we look at symptoms of people feeling stressed and um, having challenges to mental wellness, it looks like irritability, anxiousness, fatigue, sadness, and low energy. And uh, over and over again, when we talked um, both with um, staff and businesses and people in the community, um, they say that there's evidence of stress in the community um, and it looks like these things. Um, it shows up in short-tempered <coughs> behavior, people acting on edge um, with service, um, people who are providing service in the community. Sometimes it can manifest as things like domestic violence, substance abuse, um, and it puts a lot of pressure on the court system, on the police, um, on any places where people are, are providing some sort of service to the community. In terms of behavioral health gaps, there's few providers that are accepting public insurance. So um, for those, for providers who are providing behavioral health, um, most people are going to have to have some sort of a private insurance to get service in this community. Again, there's a gap in ethnic uh, providers for culturally supportive care. And we also know that there's no low cost drug and alcohol treatment in the community at all. Um, in the community. So people experiencing homelessness. So when we try and understand homelessness, it's, um, it's a pretty complicated topic, actually. The Department of Commerce has been looking at um, some of the origins of homelessness. What they found is that one of the, the biggest contributing factor to the increase in homelessness that's happened over the past few years um, has been the combination of rising rents and limited housing supply. So there's a number of factors that contribute to homelessness, which include um, mental illness, um, substance, substance use and addiction, um, gender identity, um, there's a variety of factors that contribute um, that you find in, the, in people experiencing homelessness that contribute to, um, to homelessness, essentially. But even accounting for all of those things, the commerce, the commerce evidence is pretty clear that the dramatic increase is related to rising rents. 
Um, we know that in the point in time count this year, there were only over 900 individuals um, in East King County experiencing homelessness. There's over 170 children receiving services under McKinney-Vinto Act um, in the school district this year. And what we hear from law enforcement and the legal service um, and the legal system is that they're dealing with issues of homelessness daily. A lot of the work that, or a lot of the people who are coming through those sy systems um, are the, the crimes and the issues that are, that are bringing them into that system tend to be related to their state of homelessness and, and less to um, what you would consider uh, purely criminal activity. Um, we also heard a lot of interesting information about how homeless encampments um, in and around Issaquah are creating a number of public health and environmental health hazards. Um, the cleanup measures related to um, homeless encampments when they need to be cleaned up, um, they're extremely, extremely dangerous um, situations. And what we heard over and over again is that people who are working in businesses and staff at public facilities, they don't feel that they have the training or resources to help. They feel that there's more and more people who have no place to go in the community during the day in particular. And so they show up um, at the senior center, the community center, the pool, the library. They show up in businesses around the community. And the staff who are there do not have the ability to provide them with training and resources. Um, and so when we are thinking about homelessness, there's really these three different areas. Um, there's outreach to individuals who are already homeless. There's prevention of homelessness for people who are on the edge. And then there's for people who are tra transitioning out of homelessness, um, gaps in programs for self-sufficiency. For outreach, Issaquah has a variety of agencies doing outreach. None of them um, specify it are, are specifically located in Issaquah. They're part of a much larger um, a much larger service area. So sometimes they can only get to Issaquah once every six weeks. Frequent contact is, ex is especially important for building trust with individuals experiencing homelessness um, in order to try and get them into programs and resources. There's a variety of reasons why people experiencing homelessness um, don't necessarily trust in the system, so having uh, regular contact with outreach workers is really important to that. Um, we know that outreach professionals are needed um, in, in the, to be working in the community on a more frequent basis. In terms of prevention, there's a number of uh, programs that, the, that are around the city. There's the Community Meals Program, Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank has a number of programs. Um, people who are on the bubble and who are experiencing homelessness use those programs all of the time. Um, and those can be some stopgap measures, but um, oftentimes the demand exceeds the capacity for local resources. In some things like assistance with utility bills, um, the, that can only be offered to people who need it um, a couple of times a year in order to spread the resource to all of the people who need it. Um, there's also people who aren't really aware of the services that exist in the community. And again, prevention is really tied to the housing affordability issue. In terms of self-sufficiency for someone who's living in the community and transitioning out of homelessness, they're going to have a difficult time um, getting the support they need. There's not education or employment programs in the community. Um, the lack of, su of substance abuse treatment options can also be limiting, as well as transportation barriers. If you live here and you're trying to get to Bellevue or Seattle or other places where there's services, that can be extremely difficult. In terms of aging adults, um, again, we find the issue of housing. Um, older adults um, are, 
are very cost burdened in this um, community. There's about, um, let's see, I think there's 2,800 um, older, no, I, there's 7,800 residents ages 55 and older. Um, and, and of the number of households, about 1,600 of those households are facing a cost burden. You're more likely to face a cost burden if you're an older adult living alone. Um, and you're more likely to face a cost burden as you age. So when we look at the median income by age cohort, um, we find that adults, younger older adults in the 55 to 64 category, um, they uh, tend to be still in the working world um, and so being kind of uh, more toward the, their maximum earning potential in their careers, it's not surprising that their household income is higher, that tends to be higher than average. Um, for the age cohort of 65 to 74, people are entering retirement time um, and their household income tends to be about the average. But as um, people age and they're 75 or older, we see that those household incomes start to drop. There's a variety of reasons uh, for that, um, but for, um, but, but you, you start to see some issues with um, housing and housing <coughs> affordability. Let me just take, I'm gonna go back. Um, so some other issues with housing is the availability of housing, that mismatch of housing that I spoke to before can affect the ability of older adults to um, transition into smaller housing when they need to downsize that may be cost, afford cost efficient for them. Um, we also know that um, as adults start to need more service and assistance with daily living, the options for adults who need that type of assistance tends to be pretty limited. There's Eastside Friends of Seniors um, has a program that helps people with a few transportation and some daily living things who are living independently in their homes. But once people aren't able to live independently, um, there's very few um, affordable, um, affordable housing that has um, a service component that goes with it. In terms of transportation, 16% um, of older adult households don't have access to a car. Um, because, of, because of the suburban nature of development in Issaquah, um, it tends to be more auto dependent. Um, what that means for older adults is that as long as they're able to keep a driver's license um, or afford to have a car, um, they can they can get around okay. We heard that from focus group participants at the senior center for sure. But as people lose their ability to drive, they become more and more socially isolated. Um, the the transit system in Issaquah is highly focused around moving people um, on commute patterns. So it's gonna go to parts of Seattle, it's gonna go to Bellevue, it's gonna go to Red, Redmond Overlake. Um, but there's really one bus that's moving, that's circulating through the community. For older adults who aren't able to drive a car, that last mile transportation of getting from their home to the bus stop or back um, can be extremely challenging, especially if they have to carry any kind of a bag or a parcel with them. Um, and the number of programs, there are a variety of programs, but they all have pretty special qualifications. So there's access for people who qualify for paratransit services. There's a service that brings people to Medicaid medical appointments. Um, so there's a variety of services, but not, not all of them provide full coverage for older adults. In terms of wellness, we know there's gaps in preventative care and things like uh, mammograms for, um, <coughs> for women um, in, in preventative, in vaccinations for preventative illness. Um, 
We also know that older adults report needing behavioral health support. Um, there's a variety of issues related to grief and loss that happen um, as adults age, either um, as people's own capacities start to dwindle um, and they experience grief and loss over that. Sometimes it's the loss of friends, loved ones, or a spouse, um, but those, um, those issues need significant behavioral health support. Older adults also, um, sometimes this may be the first time that they really need to rely on community resources. They may not know what those are. And um, with a variety of issues that they may be managing, they need some sort of assistance in managing a continuity of care and understanding what resources are available to them. For people who don't speak English, which is about 18% of older adults in the community, there's a number of barriers, um, cultural barriers to accepting care. It also should be noted, noted that people stress that the cost of health care and health insurance was extremely stressful to them, and um, one, of those, one of those factors that influences um, their financial stability. Social isolation is the real, um, the more we learn about social isolation, we realize that it is the biggest public health issue for older adults, um, not just in Issaquah, but across the country. Um, social isolation statistically um, increases an older adult's chance of death as much as someone who smokes, um, who regularly smokes cigarettes. Um, that's how dangerous it is for people's physical health. Um, you see poor physical outcomes in all kinds of things like um, stroke and cardiovascular disease. Um, social isolation tends to be um, uh, uh, so, tends to be um, when people or tends to happen when people start to have cognitive impairments. They start to realize, I'm not sure if I can, if I leave the house, if I'll be able to remember to come back, or they feel embarrassed about memory loss. Um, they'll tend to isolate themselves, grief and, grief and loss as well. Disability or changes in, in physical needs, um, lack of transportation, and also English proficiency keeps people socially isolated. Uh, you can keep that there. Okay. Um, so I'll just jump back in and um, say that that was a ton of information. Um, so we fully recognize that. And also the, um, I just want to make note that there, um, this, the, I think what Erica was sharing was a lot about the needs that were identified and what was heard from the community. But there is also a lot of really good things that are going on in the community. That, um, by many accounts, the health of uh, individuals in Issaquah is quite good. We know that from information from our Department of Health. We have a robust uh, nonprofit network here in town, um, and so we have, a, and we have a very good school district as well. So there are a number of things to work from, kind of working from an asset-based, strength-based approach. Um, the point here was to highlight some of the things that we had heard from the community and some of the gaps and needs so that we could be more pointed in terms of our strategies going forward. So I just wanted to provide that context. Um, this page shows a quick kind of summary of some of those key points for each of those populations uh, that we had spoken about. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, um, the, in terms of where we're going to give you a sense of the, the strategy conversation, um, as I mentioned before, those will start to provide a foundation for our work with community stakeholders. Uh, we're envisioning having some workshops around those in December and probably into January. Um, in those areas. Uh, we have been working with our Human Services and Planning Policy Commission and formed a joint commission to uh, help advise us in this work. And so we held one meeting in November. Uh, we are planning to take the results of the uh, strategy meetings to them uh, uh, in January and um, then also follow up with those work groups in February uh, before starting to progress to prepare a draft plan. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Councilmember Winterstein. Thank you. Thank you for the information. And I do recall before you started, you talked about how you compared this work recent to the uh, community needs assessment that was published in 2017. And you talked about maybe going a little bit deeper and maybe getting some qualitative and getting recognizing a, um, 
the commonality of the senior housing perhaps and their needs and uh, um, programs that are happening at the senior center. You talked about our housing strategy. So David, the, my, my question really is for you that um, f from that assessment from 2017, I mean, is this, is this and, I, and I pulled it up and I'm, I'm looking at it right now, is this addressing half of what we identified back then, a third of it, is, is, or is it a broad cover on most of the primary focus areas that we identified back there? I'm just trying to understand what have we actually, we've talked about, that I just told you what I heard was different, but I just wanna hear again from your words, like how, how this is built upon, how, how it went beyond what we did in 2017. Um, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure I can answer the, the coverage percentage, but um, certainly it's trying to um, to address some of those issues. So for example, behavioral health was definitely identified uh, within the community needs assessment. Um, that had some impact in terms of how the Human Services Commission chose to fund different agencies back then. And so that's, caught, that's uh, had some progress, uh, but we also know that we've heard from the community that there continues to be some concerns in those areas. There have been some changes in progress that we've seen uh, with the Healthy Community Sur or Healthy Youth Sur Survey, for example, um, but we also have heard from a number of the organizations that we fund that they're still continuing to see challenges. And so that we know that there's some unmet needs, even though there's some resource changes that have occurred. The school district, for example, has counselors at uh, most, at every, I believe it's every high school uh, in the school district. And so there have been some improvements, but I think there are, um, there still remain some opportunities. I don't know if that's fully answering your question. Yeah, can you go back one slide? Yes. So the way I'm understanding this is, is this, this was uh, an, a, a deeper look into some of these areas. Would you say that these now, because they made this list, um, um, we're, we're, I'm not sure if narrowing our focus is the right way to describe it, but based upon that work from 2017, this body of work, you, you're, you, you, and everybody here and others that you work with, you're kind of you're you're focusing in on these as areas that we may. I think that's your question before us. Like, help us where help us with the focused area, and because these are the areas now that are bubbled to the top. That that's correct, and so I think the major. The, the one significant change here is that we're, we're suggesting that we have a focus around populations. And really this, this operates on both dynamics and so I don't want to overstate that because there are, uh, there's a continuum of need kind of as um, people age through, in, through life in, in the community. Okay. Um, but, our th but our thought is that being centered around the, that population, there's also a continuum of need of different different types of intervention from prevention through intervention, for mm -hmm. example, for mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. population, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And the presentation that we just went through had certain slides where it clearly noted, said, okay, here are the gaps now. now but it wasn't as clear in some of the areas as well. Um, I don't know if that was just a style thing or those one that you called out as, at Lima, you actually said, okay, gaps. I think there's like two slides where they're listed really clearly. Um, am I, is that suggestive of anything you're, you're recommending or is it again just a style the way you did the presentation? Uh, I, I think it, it may be in part because of a distinction between some qualitative information and some quantitative information. Um, and then um, I think maybe there was just maybe a finer point on some of the, the different gaps. Okay, because you have a real, really nice, you know, uh, slide on number 25 of the, it, it even, it's gaps in services for homeless and housing and insecurity in Issaquah and, in pre, and then prior to that on page, on slide you know, 22, something similar for mental wellness, really focused in on what those gaps were. You know, I will say in, in listening to all of this, uh, it's really ironic, I think, that Barb is sitting next to me because it was a little more than 10 years ago when I started working with her when she was, are you still on the board of the Together Center in Redmond? I just um, Not, have been up until recently. Until recently, and that's when they were looking for potentially placing a something similar, a human services campus somewhere here in Issaquah. 
And I'm, I'm pretty sure we were talking about all of those issues and, and in a lot of ways, what's available up in Redmond, you could probably find some service provider at the, at the, at the um, Together Center up there that slots into one of these areas. And if I've heard anything through this presentation is that there isn't, something big and new that's emerged. A lot of these have been standing issues for a long time. That there are models around at a community level, at least that, that they, like they have a Together Center where, um, where uh, not only for the benefit of the community, but also perhaps for the service providers for economic and other advantages. You know, having something like a community center uh, together center like that would be very beneficial because I think a lot of these issues, there's somebody up there who is focusing on from childcare and healthcare and mental services and prevention. Um, a lot of the ones that are mentioned up there, behavioral health, uh, have service providers up there. So that's one of my takeaways is like, these are a lot of the same issues. I know people, the communities in the east side and we have been struggling with together uh, f um, for as long as I've been kind of thinking about, thinking about the matter. So. Um, you know, I, I, so I'm going to, I'm going to continue listening to what my other colleagues have to say here, but uh, I'm going to have a hard time kind of narrowing down and say, you know, I really think you ought to focus on this population or that. These are real issues for every one of these populations. And um, I'm going to be, and I mentioned the gaps earlier because where you've highlighted gaps, I think that's going to draw my attention. Thank you. Council Deputy President Batiste. Thank you for the presentation. A lot of really great information and uh, uh, really great to see that we've um, been able to do a deeper dive into a lot of these areas that will help inform us going forward. Um, my first question is maybe um, a little far out in terms of the, um, uh, maybe uh, it's in the future is what I'm trying to say. Um, in terms of the Human Services Commission grants, um, I know you know recently um, those are now bucketed in different different areas where they didn't used to be before. Um, and so, is there um, a thought around uh, those buckets now being kind of looked at in terms of the populations that and the topics that you're focusing on? Yes, thank you. Um, absolutely, we started thinking about the human services grants and whether or not it might be too early for the next um, round of uh, funding that's coming up or maybe we can make some changes. Definitely we are considering perhaps aligning those grants with some of the strategies coming out from the healthy community strategy. So thank you so much, great suggestion and yes. And so with that we hope to um, as we continue the work on the healthy community strategy and um, at the same time we continue the work on the human services grants, hopefully we can, back, uh, we can come back to council with a proposal later on in the next Gr few months. Great, and I actually have a, a follow, uh, another question about the capacity building grants. We often have treated those in sort of two different ways. There's different analysis based on those. Um, but in regard to the capacity building grants, I guess I would ask the same question in terms of whether um, there might be able to be uh, more of a focus on what is coming out of the healthy uh, community, um, uh, what has been the, the body of work that's been done here. Um, that's a, an excellent question as well. I think the capacity building grants has been kind of going under, undergoing kind of improvement on a year to year basis. It doesn't necessarily have a focus on human services organizations. Uh, there are, have been, uh, at least especially this last go around, a number, a large number of human services agencies that have been applying. Um, I think that I would suggest that that could be something that uh, should be taken a look at in the next go around for the next grant cycle in terms of the goals and the focus of that. Um, certainly we've seen um, in it, a kind of growing need for organizations that are community-based, so based organizations like the India Association or Western Washington, Muslim Community Resource Center, um, organizations that are more directly tied to some of the populations, um, and they're, they tend to be smaller uh, organizations that kind of need to build capacity, and so there is an opportunity for doing that as well. That is one of the things that we're looking at with the human services grants, is if we can 
and take a look at a subset of those grants to think about how we might structure some grants to some of those agencies that might be smaller and simpler. Uh, we've had lots of feedback from those agencies about how do you support an organization that doesn't have the a professional grant writer on staff or doesn't really have the financial kind of uh, accounting systems in place that might be required for typical grants. And just one last quick question. So as we're going forward then, um, outside of human services grants and the questions I just asked, then um, a strategy will be coming forward um, in, in terms of uh, work that could be looked at for the future in the strategic plan, correct? <coughs> Uh, correct, and so it will take the place of the, the a healthy community strategy, which is a, a strategic plan action. So. Great, thanks. Okay, I saw Council Member Ray followed by Council President Martz and Council Member De Michelle. <laughs> so if you said this, forgive me, I missed it, but what, what kind of direction are you looking for from us this evening? Um, I think we're looking for any feedback on, in particular on these kind of Sub bullets. Um, I guess there's two things. One is kind of the organization by these different populations, uh, and then the other is some of these uh, sub bullets. Uh, any feedback about them? Any thoughts? Um, any questions? We may not have all the answers, but certainly we could uh, dive a little bit deeper if there's some more questions about uh, any one of these categories. Um, as I said before, we will be using this as a starting place for strategies, um, but we also will be coming back with um, draft content. We'll also be talking about prioritization, so there will be multiple touch points. All right, well, let me share a couple thoughts. Great. That was a ton of stuff, and um, I'm glad you said something like we're doing something right, because as I listened to that, I was like, oh my God, the world is coming to an end, and this is a horrible community we live in. Um, so we've got to focus on what we're doing right and leverage that going forward. That message was overwhelming to me. And when I look at everything we just looked at, I am lost in the priorities. And so if we can't figure out what we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on nothing, and we're going to be completely ineffective. So going forward, the plan has got to focus on some, some priorities where we can move the needle. And then the final thing is, this is a regional problem. This isn't an Issaquah problem. People in need don't care about where the city boundaries are. So we have got to find a way to integrate this into a larger regional service delivery framework, because we can't solve this problem. It's not our job. So that's my thoughts. Thank you, Chair Walsh. Uh, so I was... Uh, I was just really struck uh, that the first two sets of comments uh, for, uh, from the council this evening were f was from council members Winterstein and council deputy president Batiste. Of course, uh, the two former uh, Human <laughs> Services Commission chairs uh, that we have been lucky enough to have on council. Uh, I remember going with council member Winterstein up to meet with Pam Mock and the folks at the Together Center before Paul was even on council. He wanted me to understand the services that they were offering up in Redmond. Uh, and it was it was very impactful for me, uh, and I will miss both of their voices on this subject as we move forward. Could you go to the next step slide, please? Um, so yeah, this is I mean this is what we're talking about, right? Where does the rubber meet the road? Getting human services and PPC um, and stakeholders to talk about what is possible uh, to Council Member Ray's point to get past the possibility of feeling overwhelmed to understand uh, what, uh, what we can do uh, with finite resources. In terms of the feedback, I like the organization by community. You know, we used to, human services grants used to be organized by, you know, sort of um, crisis at one end of the spectrum and sort of strategic at the other end and then uh, point in sort of life's journey. So, you know, we had neonatal all the way up through end of life. And I always loved seeing that map and understanding where our service organizations were operating. And I see this organizing by community as a, as sort of a follow-up to that, to making sure that we left, that we don't leave major areas of need unresolved. Uh, you know, the big topic that will be in front of us is the ongoing conversations around an opportunity center uh, as part of a transit ordinance development. Um, 
I would urge my fellow council members, as council members Winterstein and council deputy president Batiste are coming down off council to remember uh, their comments tonight and to remember what we're hearing about the need in the community and, uh, and see that uh, hopefully in the draft plan that comes forward and help uh, use that to inform our conversations around an opportunity center or other service delivery opportunities that we have in this upcoming year. Thank you. Me next. Okay. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, first of all, it was a, a really great um, amount of information and uh, I've been following this process for a number of years as you know involved in the needs assessment and, and so forth and uh, I think uh, looking back we remember a time when people on the east side and in Issaquah would say well we don't have any social service needs and so uh, it's really good to know that we've moved the conversation forward by this time. A couple of things when I was going through the materials that I really wanted to start a dialogue on, not, not necessarily, you know, this is the way it's got to be, but um, we were all at, there were several of us that were at a conference on Thursday, Monica was there and Mayor Polly was there um, uh, talking about uh, hopes and concerns. And uh, there was a deputy, uh, fire chief from uh, Eastside Fire and Rescue. And during the course of the conversation, he said, we had over 2,000 calls last year that had some element of social service in those calls. Um, and I know from talking to the police officers here in Issaquah that they have a very similar um, situation. Uh, another uh, firefighter told me that about 30% of their calls uh, are focused on social service needs. Um, and so when we're talking about gaps, um, uh, and I didn't see it reflected anywhere in, in the materials that were given to us, I think we really have to start looking at the fact that our firefighters and our EMTs and our jail personnel have become our de facto social service workers here in Issaquah. And we really need to start to grapple with, uh, is that a good thing? Um, and I don't wanna speak for e EFR or for the police department or the jail, um, they may have a perspective on that that we really need to hear because in many ways they're always gonna be the frontline people. Um, but uh, I think we need to address it and really start talking about it. How do we deploy our personnel and into this role of taking care of our social service needs and does that constitute a gap and how do we address it? And if it is something that they wanna take on or is it something that they would prefer that we looked at getting trained social workers to do? So that's one of the things that leapt out to me. Um, could you go back to the slide about, um, about the different, yes, okay. So <laughs> uh, as everybody has mentioned, there was a lot of, a lot of information. And uh, when I was looking at the focus areas, I do agree that we should do it by ages because all of the different um, elements uh, affect each of those age groups differently. I was a little bit muddled by uh, pulling out individuals who are homeless as a separate category because that does affect youth, it does affect adults, and it does affect seniors. And so I couldn't understand why that particular element was pulled out. And so, um, and I'm also just thinking about <laughs> Uh, what Councilman Ray said, it's just a mass of information and how does the public process it? And so um, I would like to suggest that we, you know, we retain children and youth and adults and aging adults as, as the categories that we're looking at, but that we look at a continuum for homelessness, uh, behavioral health, um, Social, what I call social justice, which would be the language and, and all those things that uh, affect diverse populations and then the affordability issues. And those would be the categories I would like, but I will let you, I'll let you grapple with that. But um, I just think we need to look at it through the lens of how are we gonna explain this all to the public? 
because it is a huge amount of, of data and how is it going to be easily understood by people as they're looking at, this, at the final strategies. Um, and then my final th point would be um, uh, my interest is, are we gonna be able to use the recommendations from these strategies for the 2021 budget deliberations? And uh, we had a person come to the last council meeting who wanted to see us increase our expenditures from 1% to 2%. Uh, will we have enough information to be able to look at that request? Um, objectively, I guess, is the, question, is the word I would use. Um, so I think our hope is that we would uh, have the strategy done in time to consider it as a part of the 2021 budget process. Um, so that's definitely our hope. Uh, the earlier piece is the human services grants process. Mm -hmm. And um, there may be, the timing is very tight for that because we need to release that in March. Um, but there might be some early things that we could consider as a part of that. Thank you. Councilmember Winterstein. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I've had a little chance to think about this a little bit more. I, actually, it's interesting that Barb actually look, pulled out or highlighted that the one that stood out, uh, the homelessness. I agree that it does span all the age groups, uh, and and yet um, it does still feel unique to me in that I think, as you've said many times, with housing affordability being such a driver, I, you know, that is being addressed at so many different levels by the city and by the region that um, it's going to be difficult. I don't. I, I, what we do from a healthy community strategy isn't going to bend that curve. I think we we have a housing strategy. We have we have um, affordability requirements for you know, as far as new development that happens, and we have that housing strategy as well. So it seems like that in in terms of what levers we may have. Um, we have some action going in all of those, and I think it is that idea, especially at out outreach. I'm still part of the meals program, and I do encounter individuals who are there regularly and some who show up one time, and, and, that, and you're so correct that n n those of us there you know, really don't have the skills or the resources necessarily to be able to do anything, but yet I still see members of the community doing whatever they can and at that moment in trying to help, and that's not the right plan. Uh, I wanted to stop the conversation earlier and say, hey, who are those people that we can contact who only get here once every six weeks? Because I have, you know, places and times where I wish they would be there more regularly. And, and so it just seems to me that uh, those who are actually at that crisis stage or uh, that still uh, need some special attention. So there, there's that comment. About the rest of this list, um, David, I know it's in the plan and you mentioned it earlier this evening that uh, in many ways we may just be a convener uh, in that there are existing service providers or stakeholders or other interests around us that have the ability and the will and the backing um, you know, to continue to do what you're do they're doing, but maybe do it within this larger context with us. And um, uh, I'm not interested in taking anything off that list but it seems to me that an exercise, and maybe you've already done this, get back to my uh, point about the gaps that you identified. Um, I think there are probably some that there are very little gap uh, of, uh, in terms of um, services available uh, because there may be community members or community organizations that are, are providing part of that. There may be some others where there's a really huge gap. And it seems to me there's a, there's a matrix in there somewhere about all of these key areas and some with smaller gaps, some with bigger gaps, some with, some with um, you know, a lot of maybe a program or a strategy behind it to address it, some that we, ha are, we have nothing about. Okay. And it would, it would be, um, I, I would wanna see that type of assessment and um, I, I think that for myself, that uh, from a city resource, you know, in terms of, you know, Barb brought up budget, right? Well, those gaps where we really think we can be effective, but we have to take the lead on it, okay, that would be a focus. But there are gonna be other gaps or other areas where we have community partners and what can, what, if anything, what can or should we be doing to assist them to be successful what they're doing. I think we're gonna, that type of comprehensive look uh, is going to be, I think a logical next step to help us make even put a finer point on how to prioritize. 
Deputy Council President Batiste. So speaking again, um, I, I just had a few more thoughts and uh, I, I just wanted to say while, while the presentation provides us with so much information about um, gaps and, and it does seem overwhelming um, as, as you're probably listening to it, but I've also said um, in conversations when we've been talking about human services grants and council members have asked for data and metrics and more information and we didn't have all this information in past years and so the point of going forward with these sorts of surveys is to, to help um, identify those needs and uh, while there are a lot of great things that go on, uh, both within Issaquah and throughout the region, we are very heavily reliant on, um, on the region and uh, a lot of times we would talk about needing to really step up in terms of helping um, maybe something isn't completely focused on um, Issaquah but for example, we don't have a shelter in Issaquah. So we, we have to really be reliant and part of the pool helping our neighbors who, who have taken on um, having shelters. So when we talk about the um, upcoming um, idea of the Opportunity Center, uh, we talk about the past, um, trying to put together a human services campus. Um, we still have a uh, million dollars sitting out there that that is focused on, on on that. And it and when we talk about the opportunity center, it really is an opportunity for Issaquah to step in and be a piece of that regional puzzle that right now we're very reliant on. Um, and I also wanted to say I think that we should not. Uh, um, it's great that we're doing this and we're being able to focus on what we could do within the strategic plan and something outside of the human services grants because we can't be completely reliant on the human services grants when we're thinking about what is needed within our community. That is a teeny piece of the puzzle. It's this much money. There's always this much need and this much money to, to go around. So we have to be able to focus on what we can do with this in, within the city and the strategic plan. And it is our job um, to take care of um, all of the, the people in our community uh, as, best, as best as we can by providing things. There were a few surprises in here as well. Um, I'm gonna point out a couple of them. Um, the rental units uh, not being able to um, accommodate people in wheelchairs, that was surprising to me and seems like something that we could kind of delve into. Why is that happening? Um, and under ADA roles and, and that kind of thing. And then just, um, I also wanted to, f to finally say, I think there's some things within here that we found out about that don't cost a lot of money, um, but things that we could do within the strategic <laughs> plan and one that stood out to me was um, sort of the, the uh, conversation around being a welcoming community. That's something that we talk a lot about and obviously there are still um, struggles around that. Um, we talked about bringing in cultural conversations. That was something that was happening in other cities and starting to happen, I think, through the Highlands Association. But there's a lot of small things in here that wouldn't cost a lot of money that could help us focus in on uh, some of these areas. So I'm not going to push my button again. <laughs> Council Member Do Michelle, your light's still on, right? Oh. Do you have, no? Okay, then I will take a moment here after all of this. Um, from my perspective, I think what Council Member Winterstein said about the difference between a city as a convener of nonprofits and other organizations versus actor is really important. And so when looking forward to a draft plan, um, I would note that we have planned and studied multiple times. And so what I would like to see out of that then is how are we going to act as a convener? What actions can we take? And so noting some of the things that Deputy Council President Batiste said, also I noticed there were things like, hey, there's only one childcare provider that uses the state childcare subsidy. What can we do to make a difference on that? Um, what can we look at our code to look at that housing size diversity mismatch? Um, what opportunities do we have as an actor versus as a convener? And what other things are just more on the strategy side of 
We would like to be a welcoming community, but I don't want everything to be, hey, we need a strategy to address this. I wanna see actions and things that we can actually do, and then other things where we really talk about either finding an existing provider or finding a new provider to meet the gaps um, that we see in this assessment. Uh, great, That's our, I love that comment. I think that is very much our hope. We want this to be very specific and actionable, so thank you for that. Okay, so I think at this point we will take public comments. Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak? Asking for a second time and a third time, and I will again mention we have an email address city council at issaquawa.gov. We would love to hear from the public, whether it's with uh, their own experiences, some suggestions, ways that they think we could address this, what they wanna see out of the draft plan, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. So at this time, how does council feel? I'm seeing a little bit of tiredness. Could we take a five minute break? Okay, I think we are going to take a five minute recess as we queue up our next presentation.
Okay, we are back. Thank you, everybody. So the last item on our agenda tonight is ID 0580, which is our Title 18 update, which for anybody who says Title 18, what is that? It's basically our building code for the city. And so this is presented by Keith Niven, Development Services Director. Thank you very much, Council Member Walsh and rest of the City Council, Keith Niven, um, Director of Development Services. I also have with me this evening, Lucy Sloman, Land Development Manager. So uh, we're gonna uh, go through this at a fairly high level. You guys um, approved um, us to update our land use code this year um, in as part of uh, budget deliberations last year. Um, and so we started uh, with a contract with makers, um, planning and architecture uh, in January of this year and started going through this. And um, you know, why, why, are, why would we update the land use code? Um, well, um, first reason is it hasn't been done holistically since 1996. Um, which is the year I moved to Washington State. Um, you know, but basically it's a patchwork of ordinances. Uh, it's hard for staff to navigate. Uh, it's hard for applicants to, to navigate. And so, you know, the idea was we're looking for a product that is clearer, more concise language with greater predictability for applicants. Um, we are looking for it to be better organized um, and easier to use. And we have a bunch of neighborhoods in the city that have different uh, d development requirements. And they are, some of them aren't even in 18, uh, not in the code publishing part that you can find online. You actually have to go to a different place to find them. So it's, it's really difficult to get through. Um, you know, we pride ourselves on being a, a, a kind of a green and sustainable city, and this is an opportunity for us to look to kind of further those agendas. Um, and then one of the things that we heard from council is that uh, our existing code has some disconnects with our approved plans, our approved comp plan, our sub area plans, and this is an opportunity to um, kind of bridge those gaps where there are um, gaps between the plans and, and the existing code. And then last but not least, um, you know, we're doing a 23 year update to a code and we don't wanna just get it to a 2019 level. We actually wanna say we know what we want to have happen in our city from growth and development standpoint for the next 20 years. We adopted the Central Issaquah Plan. We know what we want our city to look like as we move forward. So really, you know, number six is there sh we should anticipate some of those things coming along. So this is actually a code that should target 2039 and not just 2019. So um, that's where we are. So, so this was like opening that closet that you haven't opened in a long time and a bunch of stuff fell out. And, you know, really where we are right now is just really taking inventory of what, things of substance we really want to tackle with this project. And so what you can see in that first column are the things that we've identified so far um, that we think really need to change as part of this process. Um, this, is a, this is a list that it almost adds to on a weekly basis. Um, I've got a new one that just kind of came across my desk today, uh, architect, uh, not architectural, um, archeological resources. Um, our code doesn't address that at all. We defer to the state. But if you look at the, the maps and because of the lake and the rivers that we have in our community, we really should be doing something locally for archeological resources. So, so that's not on the list. It probably needs to be on the list. And so this is a work in progress. Um, what I tried to do with this uh, table is to say, okay, if these are kind of the big things that we're looking to change, how do they fulfill those goals that we listed on the previous slide? Called it driving factors uh, on this slide. Um, one of the things that we obviously need to do, um, and this list is changing on a weekly basis as well, uh, is uh, to go out and, and meet one-on-one -on -one with our stakeholders that are gonna have an interest in this update process. 
Um, we have currently scheduled a number of meetings to start these conversations with um, those uh, stakeholders. I'm gonna add um, the tribes to this list, and I'm also gonna add um, anybody who's in the permitting process but not vested. So we've got a bunch of people that have filed for applications for development of some kind. Uh, if you don't have a complete building permit or a complete subdivision plat in, by the time this new code is adopted, you're gonna be affected by the new code. And so we want to make sure that everybody who's in the process, in the stream now knows that probably by September of next year, the rules are gonna change. Um, and they can make some whatever decisions they can make between now and then that might help them along the way. Um, and then uh, we kind of put together this project timeline um, initially, kind of before we got started. Um, and as you can see, we're kind of, uh, we're sitting um, kind of up here in November. Uh, you guys appropriated some additional funds for us for critical areas. Thank you very much. That's going to help. We got those contracts started. Um, and we still hope to get a, a first draft out to the community in February. Um, and and that's, uh, that is, that's moving as, as fast as we can. Um, but really what we want to talk about with you this evening, um, I'll talk about whatever you want, but what I would love to get some direction on from you is, is how really best to work with the council to get this adopted um, sometime next year. Uh, I still think we will get it over the goal line next year, um, but it's gonna take, a, it, it has been a huge amount of staff work up to this point. I'm expecting a lot of council interaction for you guys to also understand the thought processes that we are going through. And so the first thing I think the administration would like to ask from you would be, you know, would the council entertain the idea of forming an ad hoc committee to really work out project scope process and kind of how to move forward? Um, with that, we will continue drafting code, meet with stakeholders to gauge um, level of engagement desired, and then we will proceed with council engagement as um, we sh need to. I think so, the ad hoc yes. committee idea is great, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have heard from council member Winterstein, uh, council president uh, Martz. So uh, the timeline, my understanding, for an ad hoc committee is uh, to really get crack it and that there's some work even in December for such a body. And it's also my understanding um, that if we so choose, the ad hoc committee would not need to be all currently sitting city council members. <laughs> Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So I would suggest to my fellow council members, uh, I like the ad hoc, I uh, also ad hoc finance committee. That's how often we had that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, this ad hoc committee, um, I would seriously consider uh, that we uh, ask once and future council member Hunt to consider being part of that committee. Okay. Do we have any other council member? Oh, Council Deputy President Batiste. So I think that this, uh, all kidding aside about saying yes to an ad hoc committee, uh, since I won't be here, but um, <laughs> I, I think that this, as we move over to our, you know, have moved over to our new format and we don't uh, have our, our committees anymore, this is a perfect example of something that really um, um, I think could use an ad hoc committee to really have a, a smaller group working on this and bringing back some recommendations. Um, so I'm really supportive of that. And uh, I was also going to bring up your same question. I think that it'd be great if Council Member Hunt uh, was part of this. Okay, any quest comment, questions? Okay, so I'm also going to support the idea of an ad hoc committee. I would be happy to participate. Um, I think this is something that is key to our community for the next 20 years. Um, and it's something that our, uh, 
that affects the business community, individuals, our city staff, um, just everything. So I think it's very important and I'd love to see how this goes forward because I think that is a very challenging time frame for getting everything right and having it reflect our community values, not just simplify. Uh, Councilmember Ray. I lied, I did, did want to say something. I love the idea of an ad hoc committee, I think it's great. Um, I have a name in mind, but I'll share that with you later. Um, but I guess one of the things I'd like the ad hoc committee and staff to consider is that this may have a 20 year planning horizon or view horizon, but that we build in ways to update this on an ongoing and continuous basis so that we don't get 20 years down the road and look back and say, wow, last time we touched that was in 2020. <laughs> so um, so it just as part of scope, I'd like to include that in it. And I will similarly say on that scale, I get concerned when we open Pandora's box that we're going to continue to find things like the need to address archeological items and other things. I don't want to get bogged down and not be able to complete this project. I would rather, as we progress through it, develop a hit list of things that maybe aren't going to make it into this initial review, but have a timeline for being able to address those things as we're going forward. I think that allows us to complete something without having it take two, three, four years. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other comments here? Deputy Council President Batiste. Um, I was just a uh, question about um, the stakeholders. You've got a, um, a large group of stakeholders, which seems like that, that was one of the questions. It seems like that's the appropriate group um, in, and with the additions that you talked about. Is there, um, it's a lot of people to talk to. So how does that, could you just talk, uh, speak a little bit more to how that fits within the timeline? How Shh. does that work? Sure, um, and I, I wanna also mention that um, I didn't check our webpage today, but I believe that a webpage got set up for this project. Maybe Lucy can check while I'm talking because I can't do two things at once. Um, so because it's so complicated um, and every group is gonna have a different lens, I think the only way that this made sense for me was to sit down with each of them individually and say, okay, here's what we're doing. Like, so for example, I can tell you right now, the Chamber of Commerce's like number one thing will be what are we doing with the sign code? Um, and so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about how we think the sign code will be changing from what it is today to what it's going to be and how that's gonna affect businesses. There might be another short list of things that will be of importance to smaller businesses that we know that's gonna be part of this code update. Um, Kathy may bring her own list of things that are important to her that, that we may not even be thinking about. And that's part of what this is, is a two-way conversation. You know, when we talk to master builders, um, that'll be an interesting conversation. Most of master builders' clients are single family builders. Um, and you know I, know, I know they know they need to transition to more multifamily as, as kind of just the housing industry changes in Puget Sound as we run out of green space. Um, but for now, most of their clients are single family builders. Uh, so we'll talk about um, how much single family we have left and how this code changes might affect subdivisions because there's a section on subdivisions. Um, we'll talk about you know the, the, the missing middle housing um, effort that we're going through, figuring out how do we get maybe cottages and courtyard apartments and some other types of housing that aren't prevalent in our city right now and see if they have ways to maybe think about that and help us kind of craft some code language that will work. So, so my hope is to go through these stakeholders as more of a, just a kind of a back and forth dialogue of here's what we're trying to do, here's what we think you guys would be interested in, what, what can we do that you guys might find interesting. Uh, we had a land use attorney who represents a number of clients in town and say, you know what, I'll review this. Um, I'll just do it because it'll help my clients. And so we're gonna get one of our stakeholders is just gonna be land use attorneys that might be interested in reviewing our draft code. So I think all, all the voices, I think will help get us a better product in the end. Great, 
Thank you. Councilmember Member Michelle. So, uh, Keith, you know I'm new to this, so um, where is the environmental voice in here and um, uh, is that appropriate? Uh, I'm not familiar enough to know whether environmental uh, concerns would go here. Yes. Okay. So, um, so what, so, so river and streams, um, you know, the expectation that we have is uh, there is right now, so, so part of, if you look at the table of contents that were part of the packet tonight, mm -hmm. one of the things that I like is that we are, we are creating parts. So the new Title 18 will have parts, which will be like bigger sections. And there is now gonna be a part called environment. So okay. the environment part, um, which is going to, you know, it, it then starts drawing other pieces to it that make sense. Like for example, Lucy and I talked about, does, does landmarking wanna go in the environment um, as opposed to being buried somewhere else in the code? I actually think it does. So we'll have that conversation about both structure, because part of this is making it clearer for people to find the things they're looking for, um, but you know, Things like outdoor lighting. You know, for me, outdoor lighting is a dark sky thing. That's environment. I think it should go in the environmental section. So there's a whole conversation about that. But talking with, um, you know, so so we've hired two companies. We've hired Herrera for um, kind of the the water related stuff. So streams, lakes, uh, wetlands. Um, yeah. Cara, um, Golders doing landslides, seismic, um, geology stuff. Um, we will bring all of that and have a conversation at River and Stream. So they are really kind of our environmental kind of conduit, the, the best one we have. Um, if there are other interested parties in the community that have an environmental lens, um, and tribes, tribes will have a very environmental lens. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, more than happy to talk to them. But part of why I wanted to put the, this list of stakeholders up on the uh, up on the wall was to get any feedback from you guys. If there are stakeholders we've missed, um, would love to kind of reach out and make this as inclusive as possible. Okay, follow up for just. Yeah. All right. So, what about environment or uh, what we call green building? Does that go in a different part of the code, or is that part of this? I'm title still negotiating that with David. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, um, so there's. I think there's um, pros and cons either way. Um, either you kind of incorporate it in throughout Title 18, or um, it goes, you know, as a separate item under the environment. And I think we need to talk about that a little bit more. But part of it is also scoping out how far we want to reach with those kind of green building sustainable measures. Council Member Winterstein. Thank you. It may be a small group, but I was thinking about our how our housing strategy has, uh, when we did quite a bit on just the ADUs, for example. So I know there's quite a bit of activity in this area just on remodeling. And I don't, I, when I saw, when I saw the master builders on there, I thought, okay, they'll, they represent people who just do that type of remodeling, which can sometimes be pretty significant and would probably hit upon a couple of these areas. But then you talked about them as kind of builders only. But I, I think just that there is a significant amount of activity that would be affected by this was just in the remodeling sector. That was the one no, uh, area I thought maybe. Totally, totally agree. And maybe one of the best ways, and as you were talking, one of the best ways maybe to help them understand that this is going on is to put a notice up in the permit center that this is ongoing and how they can get involved. So we will do that. That makes, um, that makes sense. Council President Martz. Um, how do we deal with the fact, I mean, the statement was made, we haven't touched this in 20 years, we shouldn't wait another 20 years <laughs> to touch it. The missing middle, we have actually touched fairly recently. And we had, so as you recall, we had a, oh, what was it called, a moratorium. <laughs> and that one of the seven <laughs> focal areas to come out of that was housing. And we developed a uh, housing plan that uh, we shared with other cities because it was so thoughtful and comprehensively done. So some of these topics yes. um, have had a recent touch and um, while they could use additional updating are a small update to hard work that's already been done and others haven't been touched in 20 years. Yes. 
Thank you for that clarification. And for you know the the uh, missing middle, um, that's clearly an implementation of one of the measures from our housing strategy. So yes, thank you for that clarification. Council Deputy President Batiste. Um, just a quick question too, and, and maybe you already went over this, but when we say public um, and the, the stakeholders, so even people who you had mentioned, somebody who might be in the middle of the process or thinking about it, that kind of thing, but it'll be open to, communicated well and open to everyone. So even, even if you're never gonna build um, that, you know, that kind of thing, um, you'd still could attend. Absolutely, and you know, so we'll have some public conversations at these uh, boards and commission meetings. Um, the web page hopefully will get uh, you know for people who do look at our website, um, and then you know if, if somebody just uh, you know were to I, hear about this and, and call, you know, we would definitely sit down. I think we would sit down with anybody who would be interested in wanting to talk about this because I think again we're trying to hear from as many people as possible. Great. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, and and because this zoning code will affect every property in the city, there is nobody who's going to be shielded from what we're doing. Everybody will get a postcard um, uh, identifying, everybody who lives in the city will get a postcard identifying we are changing our land use code and how they can get more information about that if they're interested. So. That will be yeah. happening too. So, Director Niven, you mentioned, hey, there could be stakeholders who are in the community who you haven't thought of, who you'd like to talk to. How can they reach out? Um, so, uh, they can either email or call either myself or Ms. Sloman. Our, both of our uh, contact information is on the web page. Um, is it on the, it's not up? I don't see it under major projects. It should be under maybe development services, or I don't know. Oh, uh, did you find it? Yeah. Okay, we will find the web page. Um, we we are of course uh, like a, ten days from launching a whole new website, and so I, I yes. think what we're trying to do is comment about both of that. Uh, we'll make sure it's prominent on the front page of the current site, and then we'll be easily found on the new site as well. Fantastic, that's what I was looking for. So I think at this point we will take public comment. So do we have any members of the public who are interested in commenting? Fantastic, come on up. Um, hi, I'm Trish Bloor. I live in the Issaquah Highlands, um, 1971 12th Court Northeast. I would um, be remiss if I didn't uh, talk on behalf of the People for Climate Action. It's a fledgling group, but we're um, making momentum, and um, we would like to be thought of as a major um, environmental stakeholder on this list. And we do have a meeting set up with you on December 5th. Okay. Oh, great. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Trish. And Connie? Oh, it's, it's there, but it's, oh, I broke oh. it. <laughs> it's. <laughs> you broke it, you bought it. <laughs> it looks old. <laughs> no resale. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, it is under major projects list if you knew enough to look, and it's called uh, a code overhaul or something. Mm. Fairly colloquial, which I like, I don't mind colloquial, which brings me to, gee, how do you talk code to people? Um, and normal people, which I am not one. So um, I think that is the biggest barrier. You will be able to talk to people who know they're gonna go through it soon, who go through it all the time, but you're going to have to look at it from 30,000 feet for the normal community because they have an idea of what they want 
to happen in our town and we've set up this whole vision of what we think Issaqua should be and then we created this strategic plan that supposedly points to you know, prioritize what we should do next and then we have the implementation language which would be the code that in theory is going to gain us our vision. Yet I don't have a sense that this code update is starting with this overarching vision and everything is gonna have to feed back in that. If we change this code, is that gaining the community the vision that they want? And, um, and I wanna see that feedback emphasized over and over and over. So if you're talking to a person and they say, wow, I, I know that my city is supposed to be and I want it to be this, then how is that code, can you tell them how that code is gonna get them that consistently and easily? And so in the end, we get the future that we expect and we bought into. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up a smidge. In the past, we created a small town and everybody loved the small town and the small town was very, very successful. So we are still holding on to our vestiges of small town charm while we are trying to still grow and, and become more contemporary and get enough money to sustain ourselves. So you're gonna have this natural tension that is gonna need the council to point at and say, how green do we wanna be? How dense do we wanna be? Where do we wanna be those things? And where can we sacrifice one thing for another? It shouldn't be up to city DSD staff to have to make those decisions every time because really it's not, it's not their job. Maybe 3% of the time they might have to decide that, but the rest of the time they should be easily able to point to some clear direction that you all have given them. Because I think the burden needs to, to stop. Everything can't be a judgment call, it's too onerous. And uh, so if that makes sense to you on what I think the public needs to have, um, if it doesn't, then ask me what the heck I'm talking about because I think it's super, super important. Thanks, and I'm gonna fix it. Thank you, Connie. Do you have any other public comments? Okay, fantastic, thanks. Glad Connie fixed that. <laughs> Good evening, council members. I'm Christy Triple with Rally Properties at 1595 Northwest Gilman Boulevard. I will uh, do my best to articulate it this hour. It's well past my pumpkin time. So um, a couple of things as um, you're thinking about uh, code revamp. One, I'm super excited as an organization that is consistently using it or working to it to interpret and support our tenants through it. I think um, what would be very helpful to everyone involved, I'm a big believer in usability. So testing a couple of projects, um, hypothetical projects or not, to see if the code actually supports what the intended outcome is. Um, we heard earlier during David's and his team's presentation that there are few ADA units um, in the multifamily environment. Part of that is because there was a time when multifamily was disincentivized. It wasn't easy to build. So when we were looking back in 2007 and doing a product, it didn't really support, it wasn't easy to do and the costs involved just for impact fees were about $100 more per hour even building smaller units. And so thinking about what's important to us as a community and finding ways to kind of prioritize that I think is super important. The other thing I would suggest is looking to organizations like Urban Land Institute and NAOP, um, multifamily housing um, office. We, we hear the community talking about wanting to have more jobs here. How do we support some of those commercial developments to happen on the valley floor where, um, where the community may want it? And then 
Having consistency and clarity in the code is super important for anyone using it, not only for staff, but for developers going through the process. We'll often find a time when we're in the middle of a project review where there's no prioritization of what takes precedent. And maybe those two things, maybe between parks and PWO, they bump up against one another. Both equally important, but how do you kind of work through that? Um, so I think those are important things. Um, I think the other organization, back when the community was going through the Central Isquah plan, that was helpful was Forterra, talking about complete, connected, and compact communities, but also they share that value with our community of a green Issaquah. And they're already looking at the tree canopy for us. Um, so I think there's some ways to kind of look at that as you look at the environmental piece as well, about what works well in the urban form, what works well in our open space and natural environments as well. So it's a great opportunity, I'm excited. It is a huge heavy lift. I don't envy the DSD staff, but I'm hopeful and have faith that when it's done, it's gonna make everybody's life easier and for staff, um, help them with their, the time that they spend each day working on projects and trying to navigate through that. So thank you. Thank you. And do we have other community? Oh, okay. Second time, any other public comments? And a third time. Okay. This has been a weighty evening with a lot on our docket. Uh, City Administrator Bob quits. Mm -hmm. So just to come back to the, uh, the ad hoc. Um, the, the council can appoint ad hoc two ways. One, the council president can appoint, or the council itself can appoint. And would suggest perhaps if the council is comfortable to have the council president appoint, then we wouldn't have to bring it back to a regular agenda. So if there's interest, certainly I think the council president could solicit it. But if we could get at least a, a general consensus that that's some, where the council would like to go, we'd appreciate that. Okay. And I did see uh, Council Member uh, Winterstein. Do you? Did you yeah, have a I did. Comment? I yeah. did. I, I asked a question for staff. Can you just take a moment and tell me what this is not? <laughs> it is not. It's not zoning. We're not changing any zoning. Um, it's not land use. Uh, it might drive comprehensive plan changes. No, maybe not. It's so it's, not. I mean, there was there was some talk this evening that is, I mean, it's this big talk, and I and I get that, but I I think in fairness to everybody who's trying to participate, let's make sure, you know what are where are the boundaries of this? So we're not doing like a like a you know a, an all new you know vision for the entire city and all of that like we did for the sub areas that we have. So this is not even a sub area plan. And I was looking at the categories that you have on slide three of your presentation. And, and a couple others jumped out at me, like for like allowable uses. That's one of the things that we recently looked like, looked at in the central area, for example. Yes. So so that is that that's that can be a big deal, I, I think. Uh, but but I think it's just very important for everybody involved. I think it's a fair. It's even as even as I sit here and I think about this and the comment made about for maybe the average uh, citizen who may be involved. I think making sure we, it's just very clear on what this, what we're not doing with this. Not that we're throwing a wet blanket on, it, and, and on anything, but this, is, this has got a boundaries to it. Let's just make sure what those are are clear. Absolutely. Well, and I think, I think that's a great point because our starting was that sort of synthesis and integration of the pieces and trying to get consistency. And then having targeted pieces that we're looking at because for instance, signs does not comply with a Supreme Court decision, or we know trees have been, we have the tree canopy assessment, and we have a lot of challenges with both staff and citizens working with our tree code. So there, I think that's part of the reason that we put that list up there, is because we're not trying to change everything. We're trying to focus on the pieces um, where we feel we're out of sync or um, uh, an update is needed. 
Okay, Council President Martins. So I want to look to my fellow council members and see if there is anyone who would be uncomfortable with my uh, do, uh, putting or appointing an ad hoc uh, committee for this. I don't see any, so I would ask that if you have any ideas for potential uh, members of the ad hoc, uh, I think I heard one volunteer. Um, Another person who was uh, suggested on the outside. On the outside, and then a third person who has a secret nominee that uh, hopefully I'll hear from later. Um, <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you have an interest, uh, please let me know as soon as possible. Um, I'll also mention, uh, for the sake of our newer council members and for the uh, folks at home, as they say, um, to point out that, uh, well, I guess it's not changing code, but that, um, you know, hearing from a representative of, of Rally Properties points out to me that we have development agreements with Costco, Lakeside, Rally Properties, Swedish Issaquah. Uh, how would... Uh, so it, obviously they're uh, vested, I believe is the word, uh, for code, but would they uh, be potentially impacted um, by any of these activities? Or are they, is their vesting include the topics that we've got in front, in front of us and in front of this potential ad hoc committee? Um, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, what I would say is, so Costco's development agreement was very clear that they were going to rely on city code um, for a lot of it. There was just certain things that got changed. Um, the Rowley's development agreement is much more comprehensive. So, but also, you know, as the city adopts different standards or updated standards, there's always conversations with those development agreement owners um, about, you know, that there may be a better way to do something. And so there's opportunities to then adjust based on the updates to the code. So it's very relevant. Plus, both Costco and Rowley's are long, 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 long time um, property owners. They will be here when their development agreement is done. Some, some um, generation of them will be here. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, they are, they will be ultimately impacted by what we adopt and what is future um, iterations of that, which hopefully won't wait for 23 years. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Ray, did you have something? No, okay. Looking around, I think we're at the end of our rope here. Wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Again, for the public, please feel free on any of these media issues to email us. I don't think I have to repeat it at this, this point. And Council President Smarts. Thank you, Chair Walsh. I just wanted to mention, I know we're not having for good of the order, but uh, uh, new council member DeMichelle was not the only person that had their status changed uh, with the certification of the vote today. I believe you had your seat confirmed. Yes, um, So indeed. congratulations. Thank you. And uh, you're, you're, you're now, uh, you know. <laughs> I don't An elected say a, <laughs> rather than appointed, yes. Yeah, I want to say like a real boy like Pinocchio, <laughs> but, but you, you know what I mean. Yes. So congratulations. Yes. Okay, and with that, I think we will close our meeting at 10.05 p.m. Thank you. So